Okay, so we're working on one-sided limits. And unfortunately, I think I erased that video that we recorded yesterday for the lecture. So I, I posted a link to the video for the Pearson person that was, um, or the author who was doing videos on this section. We didn't finish the section and I'll kind of review a little bit of what I talked about, but we need to be able to look at piecewise functions, be able to graph them, and then look at limits. And limits or, um, are gonna really be important around those values where the inequality changes for the domain for the equation. And so go ahead, I'll give you a few minutes and see if you can graph this function f of x where you have the square root of the quantity one minus x squared and you're using that equation for any values where zero is less than or equal to x or less than one. You're gonna use just one if it are values of x between and including one, but not two, and use two if x equals two. So I'm gonna pause the video while you guys try that. Okay, so you guys had a few minutes to try to graph this, and so let's go over it. So piecewise functions, basically there are multiple equations and it depends on your domain or what values of x you are using depends on which equation you're gonna be plugging into. And so I tend to like to graph each piece a little bit or separately. And I start with plugging in points and I always wanna see what's going on on the in values of my inequality. Even if it's strictly less than or strictly greater than a number, I wanna see what's happening at that number because I know I'm getting really, really close to that number even though it's not included. And so looking at the first equation, y um, equals the square root of one minus x squared. And if I look at my n value here of zero and I plug it in for x, I would get the square root of one minus zero squared or the square root of one, which I know is just one. Because this is a piece on my inequality, I personally just type, like to write a little note to myself telling myself that this is gonna be a solid circle because it is included at the one value. So if you know what the general stretch is, you can continue to go or we can plug in more points between zero and one. Um, I know that it's kind of looking like a, a square root function. Um, if I plug in one here, I get one minus one squared. Well, one squared is one. So one minus one is zero. So the square root of zero gives me zero. And I know that this is in an open circle. Okay, so at zero, one, I have a solid circle. And at one zero, it's an open circle. And I'm coming down. And I can get a better idea actually what the shape is. And when we use calculus um, a little better and derivatives, we'll be able to know is it, is it concave up or concave down? And I guess I could, like I said, I can, let me maybe plug in one more point that might help me. So if I plugged in 0.5 in here, I don't have my calculator. Um, I would have 0.5 squared, which is 0.25. One minus 0.25 is 0.75, the square root of 0.75, which is 0.75. So, oops, I wasn't sure which way this, this calculator worked. So let's try this. Oh, that is, so point, um, that's a point eight seven about. So I was off. So 0 0.87, it's more up here. And so it's more of this way. Shape. Okay. 
So again, let me just put that in there. So when I plugged in a half, this gave me approximately 0 0.87. Okay, so you cannot extend that graph to the left of x equals 0, and you cannot extend this piece of the graph to the right of x equals 1 because of the domain, and that would fall out of there. And so now looking at the graph y equals 1, well, y equals 1 is just a horizontal line. And we're going to have a horizontal line at y equals 1 between 1 and 2, including 1, but not 2. So I already kind of know what that looks like. And so let's see. Uh, x equals 1. We have 1. And it's a solid circle. Oops. And then when we get to x equals 2, we have an open circle because it's not included and it's horizontal. And then we have one point because it says use the value of 2 when x is 2. And so this is just telling me that I have a point at 2, 2. It's not going to extend. That green graph is not going to extend to the left or right between, not going to go further to the left of, of 1 or to the right of 2. And that was just a point. So hopefully that's what you got. And then, and if not, hopefully you understood what you did wrong and how to approach it next time. So let's um, look in the following. I was just saying that when I copied this, it was on a bigger screen and then putting it on the smaller screen, it just came really blurry. So I apologize. So let me just kind of write down what it's saying. So what are the domain and ranges of this function? What um, point C, if any, does the limit as X approaches C f of x exist. Is that what I said? At what point um, does the left hand limit exist but not the right hand limit? And at what points does the right hand limit exist but not the left hand limit? Okay, so let's first talk about part A, which is finding the domain and the range of our function. Well, with piecewise functions, you're basically given the domain um, and it's with which equation you're using. And so there's three pieces. And so basically we're looking at everything from zero, not into one, not including, but for this piece, we're gonna include x equals one. So one is part of our domain. So, so far we have from zero to one. And then same thing with here, we have everything from one to two, but not including, but we include two down here. So we're hitting all of the x values in our domain. And a lot of times we like to write things in interval notation, but we could write it as just from zero comma to two. And we're including both of those. We're hitting all the X values from here to here. Or another way to state this is zero is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to two. Okay, so range, range are all the outputs, the y values that you're getting back after you plug in your input. And so looking at our output, let's look at the y values that you're hitting. So notice that the smallest value that we're getting close and close to but not including is y equals zero. And so here, if I think of it this way, I'm not including zero, and then I'm hitting all the number y values because of that pink graph, up to one. It's a solid circle there, so I know I'm including it there. So I kind of put a bracket to tell myself I'm gonna include it. But notice there's no y values between one and two. And so I can't include any of those y's, and I'm just gonna include two. So range, if I wanted to write this in interval notation, we're starting at zero, but not really including, so put the parentheses. We're going up to one, so bracket, union. So this really isn't an interval, this is just a number, so we can just say the set two. Or 
if you wanted to put it in inequality notation, we have zero is less than, we're using y values for range, not x. So zero is less than y, which is less than or equal to one union um, y equals two. So piecewise functions are one of those ones that we have to worry about left and right hand inputs. We might be getting different values. And then when our domain is limited, we also have to worry about left hand and right hand um, limits, right? So if you have some interval and you're not looking at X values outside of that interval, then it wouldn't make sense as you coming into the, the um, left of your leftmost interval. So this is where left hand and limits are, are good. Um, so what, at what point C, if any, does the limit X approaches C, F of X exist? I'm really actually not sure what they want there. I'm thinking what they're saying is, if I have to look at this and I had to look at the limit anywhere on here, well, I know I'm going to be able to look at the limit um, if any does the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. Okay, so I know multiple things. I know that the limit is going to work if I'm in between um, this zero and one, but not including. And so, so what values? At what point? I don't know why they're saying points. If any. Does a limit as x approaches c of f of x exist? Well, we know that limits exist if the left-hand value is going to equal the right-hand value. And so we're going to have a problem right here at x equals 2. So let's look first at our problems. So we're going to have problems at x equals 2. But well, even beforehand, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems when we're looking at the limit as x is approaching 1. Because my left-hand side, I'm getting closer and closer to 0. Or my right-hand side, as x is getting closer and closer to 1, I'm getting to 1. So I know I'm going to have problems also when x is equal to 1. Um, it doesn't make sense being outside of the domain when we're looking at this. So basically, the limit is going to work for values of C, where C is contained. This value C is contained between 0 and 1. And then union, C is contained between 1 and 2. Okay, so this is what they were wanting for the value of C. So we wanted to look at this interval where we have these pieces and we wanted to include them in here. And the next piece says, well, let's look now at these um, values where, where is there a point where the left-hand limit exists but not the right-hand limit? Well, notice here this pink, we have a left-hand, um, we do not have a left-hand limit, right? There's not even part of this graph. So that doesn't work. Um, at what point does it have a right-hand side limit? Uh, 
this again is where, sorry, I think I'm going opposite of what I'm supposed to. So it says x equals two and x equals zero. Okay, I guess I was doing it right. Sometimes I question myself on some of these. Um, maybe you do the same thing. So at what point does a left hand limit exist, but not the right hand limit? Okay, so left hand limit, um, it's existing here at x equals one, but the right hand limit does not exist here. Ah, sorry guys. We're gonna have to just come back to those. I don't wanna get stuck on this and it's, it's, I'm having a problem. Don't worry about it. Those left, oh uh, yeah, sorry. So let's, um, let's jump to a different one. Um, so let's look at, I pulled up some stuff that we should remember that's gonna be helpful when we're doing this algebraically. So you have your limit laws. Um, so remember, basically, if we have a limit and we're taking the limit of a sum of two functions, basically we can look at the limit of the first function plus the limit of the second function, et cetera. The one thing that's really cool is that we know if we take the limit as x approaches c of a polynomial, basically we can plug in that value wherever you see an x. And so these rules above here, we can manipulate, uh, I'm using these rules to make the piece that we're taking the limit look like a polynomial. So let's move that one down. Maybe. Or not. And let's look at this following 11. So we're looking at this limit as X is approaching negative 0.5 and it tells us that we're coming in on the left. So the limit as X is approaching negative 0.5 coming on the left and the function in here is the square root of X plus two all over X plus one. So first thing we kind of want to see is this value even in the domain. And so looking at this, we have a rational function. A couple of things, we can't have values that set the denominator equal to zero. So if we had y equals this, we have a couple of um, restrictions. X can't be equal to negative one because that would set the denominator equal zero. And we have a rational function, um, a radical, and we can't have negatives underneath the radical and get back a real number. And so there we have to treat x plus two all over x plus one. This has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I'm just talking about the domain real quick. So rational functions, we kind of saw these a little differently. We could graph it and figure out where it's above and across uh, below the x-axis. The values where it could be changing, um, positive or negative, is where it would cross the x-axis. That's where you have um, set the numerator equal to zero. And so that would occur at negative two. I tend to put these on a number line. That's a critical value. The other critical value that we would have is what sets the denominator equal zero. That is going to be, in this case, a vertical asymptote. And so I know at negative one, I'm also getting a place where it could be changing positive or negative. So this is where you can test values, plug it back in to see if it's true or false. So we want to test three separate intervals. We want to look at something less than negative two. So if we plugged in negative three, anything less than negative two, we want to see is that true or false. Is negative three plus two all over negative three plus one greater than or equal to zero? I really don't care what it is. I just don't want to know, is it positive or negative? So negative three plus two is negative one. Negative three plus two, I'm sorry, negative three plus one is negative two. So negative over negative is positive. So this is true. Okay, so that's part of our solution set. 
it's okay that it's zero at negative two because I can have the square root of zero. Choose a number between negative two and negative one. So let's say x equals negative 1.5. Plug it back in. So is negative 1.5 plus two, that would be a positive number in my numerator, all over negative 1.5 plus one, that's a negative number in my denominator, is that greater than or equal to zero? And that's false. Okay, so that's not even part of our domain. We can't use any of those values. And now choose something bigger than negative one. And bigger than negative one, so how about x equals zero? So if I plug in zero here, I get two over one. Is that greater than or equal to zero? And it is. So I can use any x values um, bigger than negative one, but remember we could not include negative one. So is negative 0.5 inside my limit? It is, right? Negative 0.5 is over here. Oops. I know it, then it's continuous there and I can start using my limit laws. And so we can just basically go in and, and take the limit of this. But with that limit law, basically with that radical, we can say this is the same thing. And I just kind of want to reiterate the limit laws, but we're not going to, again, really use them all the time with this. But with that limit law, we can take the, the square root. We can put that on the outer piece and then take the limit of the radicand. There's a rule that says then that we can I took off my keyboard hoping that I could write flat. But I don't like that. Okay, anyways, um, I can take the limit. If I have a limit, this x plus 2, right, is a polynomial. x plus 1 is a polynomial. It says if we have a limit of a rational function, we can look at the limit of the numerator or the limit of the denominator. So again, we can break this down. Limit x approaches negative 0 0.5 on the left of x plus 2 all over the limit as x approaches negative 0 0.5 on the left of x plus 1. So let's just go in and plug it in. So we got negative 0 0.5. Plugging wherever you see an X. I have a question after you're finished. Okay. Um, so negative 0 0.5 plus 2, that is 1.5. And if you plug in negative 0 0.5, that should be a negative. In here for X, negative 0 0.5 um, plus 1, that's 0 0.5. So I personally don't like um, radicals in the, or I don't like decimals in fractions and I can get rid of that by multiplying by a fancy one. I need to move it over one spot, so 10 over 10. So this would give me 15 all over five, which would give me the square root of three. Okay, so the limit as we're approaching negative 0 0.5 on the left 
would give us a back a value of root three. Okay, so let me pause. Okay, so just um, clarification on the question was, if we're coming in this negative 0 0.5, we had the negative in front, which tells me I'm going to the negative number, but this negative exponent up here tells me that I was coming in on the left-hand side of negative 0 0.5. And so we know that the graph is somehow approaching this value as we come in. Um, yesterday, we looked at this rule and we kind of looked at the graph um, on Desmos, looking at the limit as theta goes to zero, if we have sine theta over theta, this is always equal to one. And so we can use this fact to help us and manipulate sometimes things um, to help us. And so the next example says that the limit, I'm just gonna rewrite it. Looking at the limit as X is approaching zero, of x squared minus x plus sine x all over 2x. So notice that we only have a single term in the denominator. And so we can technically break this down as three separate fractions. So this is the same thing as the limit as x is approaching 0 of first term x squared all over 2x minus the second term in the numerator, x all over 2x, and then plus sine x all over 2x. So our whole goal is to get and manipulate, if we have the sine x in there, to look like this. Okay, so I noticed that when I rewrite um, the first term, things simplify really nicely. So we get the limit, and we can put, break this up as three separate limits. The limit as x goes to zero. So x squared all over 2x, rules of exponents, this reduces to x over 2. And then we have minus the limit as x goes to zero. Well, x over 2x, x is canceled. This just gives me 1 half plus the limit as x goes to zero of sine x all over x. So all I'm gonna do with that two in that, that denominator, we can rewrite that. That's the same thing as one half times that. Just pulling that two out as a fraction. Okay, so let's use the rule. Well, x over two, that is a polynomial. It's like one half times x. And so we can use a rule that we can just plug in our value for x. So if we do that, this gives me zero over two minus, well, if we take the limit of a constant, that is always just the constant. So this is just one half plus, so the limit, we can say this is the same thing as one half times the limit of sine x over x. And because of this rule, that sine x over x is one. And so we have zero over two is zero. So we have negative one half plus one half. Well, that gives us back zero. That's a lot of fun. The next one I wanted to show you, I honestly, I didn't see the trick until I had to read how they did it. Sometimes, you know, it's not so obvious. Um, so those trig identities, do you guys remember all your trig identities? A bit. I didn't make all my students memorize them this summer. <laughs> I try to forget. No. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to block that out of your head. But there's some of them that will come up and will be helpful. And I guess that half angle identity is one of those 
been a while since I taught Calc 2. Um, so I don't remember which ones are, are really important. Um, so, but let me go over that half angle identity because with these problems, our whole goal is to get something like sine of x over x, looking at the limit of that. And then we can just say that that's one. And so let's look at the following example. Or actually, before we do that, let me just go over that one trig identity. So recall, if you had sine of a half angle, so maybe let's just call it x over two. This was equal to plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of x all over two. Okay, so they manipulated this and solved for cosine of x in terms of sine of x. And so we want to get cosine of x by itself. And so we know we can do that. We can clear our radical by squaring both sides. And if I square this plus or minus, that's also going to make it positive. That plus or minus really had to depend on what quadrant you were in. Was it positive or negative? But squaring it gets rid of that. And so here, then we get sine squared. Remember, we could write sine of an argument quantity squared, the same thing as sine squared of this x over 2. It's the same thing equals, well, the whole point of squaring this was to get rid of the radical. So we have 1 minus cosine of x all over 2. So I get cosine x by itself again. So let's clear a fraction. And we can get rid of the 2 in the denominator on the right-hand side by multiplying both sides by 2. So we get 2 sine squared of x over 2. is equal to 1 minus cosine of x. I want cosine of x by itself, so let's subtract 1 on both sides. Um, and so if I subtract 1 on both sides, this would give me 2 sine squared x over 2 minus 1 equals negative cosine of x. And then let's just multiply everything through by a negative so that we can make that positive cosine of x or divide everything through by a negative. And then I'm just going to rewrite it so that my positive, my term in front is positive. So this is really negative 2 sine squared x over 2 plus 1. So I'm just going to write that as cosine of x is the same thing as 1 minus 2 sine squared of x over 2. Okay, so sometimes knowing a couple of identities is helpful and then manipulating the identities to help you is helpful. Trying to manipulate things to look like things that we can, we know and can use. And so from there, let's look at the following example. Um, where is here? So we're looking at the limit as x goes to 0 of x minus x cosine of x all over of sine squared of 3x. And it wanted us to use, again, the fact that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x all over x is 1. So we want to manipulate this to be this way. So looking at the numerator, notice that, actually, I'm just thinking um, different ways to approach things. Sometimes, you know, there's different things. First thing I would have said is let's factor out that x. So if we factor out that x, that would give me 
I'm wondering if that's going to help me. Yeah, let's do that. So sometimes you just got to try and if it doesn't work out, then try a different route. So let's just try that. So let's factor out an X. And so factoring out an X in the numerator, we get one minus cosine of X all over sine squared of three X. Okay, so let's go back and kind of do what we just drove, that cosine of x. This is the same thing as, so I'm just going to replace this cosine of x with this whole thing. Okay, so if I do that, I got the limit as x goes to zero of x all times one minus this whole quantity. That whole quantity was one minus two sine squared of x over two in my bracket. Um, parentheses and my parentheses all over sine squared of three x. Let's clean this up by distributing that negative. So we have the limit as x is going to zero of x. Well, distributing this negative inside that parentheses to the bracket, notice that will give us one minus one. And so the constants of one cancel. And then that would give us just left with a positive two sine squared x over two. all over sine squared of 3x. Fortunately, we can't cancel because they're not the sign of the same argument. I'm thinking that we want to rewrite this a little bit. So let's break this down. I'm going to break down sine squared of x over 2 as sine of x over 2 um, times sine of x over 2. Same thing with the denominator. That squared, I'm going to break it down. So this is x all times 2, all times sine of x over 2, sine of x over 2. And this is sine of 3x times sine of 3x. Um, okay, I have so, a question. Mm -hmm. So you took x times 2 do you still distribute the x into the sine? Or no? Um, right here, this x to the sine, I mean, that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, like, do you distribute the x anywhere else besides the two? No, no, because there's no addition or subtraction there. And sine is a, is a function, and so it's really sine of that value. It's not sine times x over two. Um, and so, I mean, with strictly multiplication, we can just leave it like that. Oh, well, I guess we don't. Um, basically, right now, our goal is to take this and manipulate it so that we can look at and try to have this as a form of the limit. As sine x over x, or something similar to that. And so, Let's see. There's a couple ways that we can do this. Let's, let's first look at it this way. Let's um, first multiply by a fancy one. I want really, and I can think of this 
let me just do it this way. Let's think of this as multiplying by a fancy one, but I want things in the denominator. I want something like this over x over two. And so what if I do one over x times x? or one over x squared, one over x times x. And the sole, only reason why I wanna do that is if I do that, then I can rewrite this numerator. Remember we can take the limit of a product and break it down. So technically right now I have a limit as, and let me pull out this, maybe we can pull out this two x, f two x times we have the limit here as x goes to zero. So when I distribute this, I'm gonna look at sine of x over two all over one of those x's. And I'm gonna look at sine of x over two all over this other x. That's why I didn't write it as x squared. And then this is all over the sine of 3x all over x and times sine of 3x all over x. So just manipulating to be equivalent, but to try to manipulate it to look like the form we need it. And we're almost there. So in this case right here, we need this to be, this x to be divi di divided by two. So a couple ways I can do that. Let's multiply the numerator by a fancy one. Let's multiply this right here. Well, let's multiply this piece right here by one half over one half. And let's multiply this fraction by one half over one half. And I can multiply the denominator by three over three to make this a three X in the denominator. And I can multiply this by a fancy one, three over three. Well, this is not really nice. Can't you just tell this is gonna be zero because of factoring out that X? Oh, well. Let's just carry on, zero times. Um, so this piece right here, because of our limit rule, this piece right here now, this goes to one, sine of x over two all over one half times x, that goes to one. So you're just left with one half here. And then we manipulated it, so this also went to one, but times the one half that's left that we had to multiply by, right here. That goes to one. And this goes, that goes to one, so this would go to three and this would go to three because of that three. So, well, zero times anything is zero. I feel cheated. I should have noticed that at the beginning. That we factored out an X and it was just going to zero. So that, I'm um, sorry that I ran a little bit over. And then I'll come back tomorrow with that one piecewise and explain it left and right in values. But that's pretty much um, 2.4. The next section is 2.5, which is on continuity. I thought I'd get to today, but didn't.